Um, okay, so welcome, um, welcome to this uh, Collegium Talks event, which is organized uh, by the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies at the University of Helsinki. And my name is Kaisa Kaakinen, and I am working as research coordinator at the Collegium, and I'm also a, a, the curator of this uh, Collegium Talks series. And um, I, I said a few words first about the series. So this uh, series now, this uh, spring, and actually also next fall, will uh, give the floor to two uh, Collegium researchers at the time, who discuss a topic that is connected to their own research and that they have chosen themselves. And I'll just mention, I added in the chat uh, a link to the website of this series. So you can go there to see also the full description of this current event, but you'll also see the first event that we had on April 1st. The link that is there is still actually actual, so you can you can go to the video link and watch the video of our event Thinking Extinction with Christine Degel and Shin Liu, so that was two weeks ago. And then uh, two weeks from now, on 29th of April, we have the third part of our uh, Colleen Talks series this spring with the title Social Media and Politics of the Future. And the spe speakers there are Airi Alina Allaste and Kinga Bowinchuk Alenius. So stay tuned also for that event. But today, our title is what you see uh, on the screen Is Another Europe Possible After All? And the subtitle is actually Reflections on the European Green Deal and the COVID Recovery Plan. And I'd like to introduce to you briefly our speakers, who many of you also know. Uh, Heikki Patomäki is professor of world politics at the University of Helsinki and he was originally trained as an economist and he is published extensively in various scholarly fields ranging from big history and philosophy of social sciences to European global and future studies. And our another speaker is Magnus Rühner, professor of international political economy at King's College London and currently core fellow at the Helsinki Collegium. And Magnus Rüner has also published extensively on the uh, issues that are related to our, our topic today on the problem of welfare capitalism in the, in the era of global neoliberalism, as well as on the so-called Nordic model uh, and the German social market and European integration. And before we start, let me mention that there will be the, the Q&A at the end, and I would ask you to use the chat function of Zoom for that, uh, because there we can easily see the um, order of who uh, was uh, asking for, uh, who was uh, who was uh, who has a question, and um, you can either indicate that you have a question and then you can voice it here, or you can also write questions and comments uh, during the discussion. And uh, we will then turn to it after the debate uh, between the two speakers. So that's all from me. Uh, I'll give the floor to Magnus and Heike. Thank you very much, Kaisa. Um, the way we've decided to do this is that uh, Heike and I will give uh, five minute introductory remarks where we will basically lay out our central claims uh, in relation to the, to the question. And then we will have a dialogue uh, for about half an hour where we respond to each other. Uh, in that uh, period, you're more than welcome to put to questions and comments in the chat. And if there's a lot of energy, we may open up uh, before the half an hour to get a, a discussion. Otherwise, we will generally open up for Q&A and, and comments after that 30 minute exchange between, between Heike and me. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, by outlining uh, my claims. So if I can actually find my slides, there they are. Um, and um, 
actually. I'm going to go back first and elaborate a little bit on why, they, why the question arises in the first place. Uh, why would one ask if another Europe is possible after all? Uh, and uh, basically, I think that one can say that uh, uh, the European Union, at least since the late 1970s, can be characterized as broadly a neoliberal construct around the uh, principles of what Friedrich Hayek called an interstate federation. That is that at the federal level, basically is, uh, is restricted to market making uh, 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 policies to facilitate the creation of a single market, uh, uh, also associated with the budget discipline and uh, and uh, price stability. And then basically other competences are on the national and subnational level where those actors are appropriately disciplined by the framework set at the, at the European and international level. That takes the, uh, the form primarily of competition policy on the basis of mutual recognition. Uh, a, uh, a monetary policy since the European Monetary Union governed by the European Central Bank that adheres strictly to uh, price stability criteria and that also is prohibited from lending to member states and other EU institutions. Uh, in the last uh, year or so, there have been a number of developments that, um, uh, that have uh, possibly put into question whether that is still the case and that would give some hope to those who would have liked to see a kind of an, an emergent common European uh, social uh, and ecological project that is based on uh, on the overall European solidarity and solidarity between European peoples. Uh, and uh, the things one can point to is they are uh, is the ratcheting up of so-called quantitative easing and expansionary monetary policy, of course, in response to the tremendous depressing effect on the economies that, that uh, uh, COVID-19 has had. And so, for example, the European Central Bank have instituted the 1, uh, 1, 300 bill, uh, 1,350 billion euro uh, pandemic emergency purchasing program, the so-called PEP, in fiscal policy, we have the next generation uh, uh, European, uh, next generation EU European recovery plan of 750 billion euros. That is part of the new annual uh, of the new budget, uh, which increases the overall European budget from one to two percent of EU GDP on average per year. But significantly, it is deficit funded to uh, to boost. Uh, demand and to support member states for boosting demand and it is based on so-called mutualized bonds so we get some a euro denominated bonds that also create a kind of an EU, EU level uh, safe asset and a support for those uh, uh, member states that are in financial stress then it can, that could be seen very much in contrast to the approach that was taken after the in the eurozone crisis management. 37% uh, of next generation EU money uh, boosts fiscal support for and is targeted for the so-called European Green Deal. That is the gold plating that the new commission, uh, uh, when it came in, announced to, uh, to, to make uh, Europe uh, carbon neutral by uh, 2050, uh, 2050, and thereby gold plating the commitments that was made in the Paris Agreement to a more sustainable form of development. And also quite interestingly, putting in a kind of a, an active tariff policy, at least as a possibility in relation to those other part of the world, other parts of the world that do not adhere to, to the Paris commitments in the form of the carbon border adjustment mechanism that could also be seen as a departure from the neoliberal form of governance. So that is a kind of development that, uh, that motivate perhaps raising the question. These would be the, the, the claims that I would make in relation to this. That in substantive terms, just on the basis of what we have today, I think that the answer would be, well, it isn't really another Europe. Uh, um, it is more than anything else characterized by business as usual. And particularly, I would point to that the next generation EU is subject to the structural reform 
uh, agenda and the conditionalities uh, in the so-called European semester and country-specific recommendations. To actually access this, these funds, you have to adhere to basically a benchmarking and recommendation uh, uh, exercise that is a neoliberal in its, in its nature. The European Green Deal is based on so-called blended fi finance and market mechanisms, such as European emission trading schemes, and is very much in line with uh, what in the literature uh, is called uh, finance-led capitalism. There is also a very, very strong uh, element of critical raw materials extractivism. Uh, decarbonization is going to require um, uh, access to critical raw materials that are mainly available in, uh, in places like Africa, Latin America, and that is leading to a new scramble for Af Africa in relation to China in particular, and it is in that context I think that one should see the call for a more geopolitical EU. That is in substantive terms. There are significant uh, uh, transformations, however, in the form of governance. And that is sort of the central major claim that I would, I would make that makes it increasingly difficult to depoliticize EU neoliberalism. In the end of the day, the legitimacy of neoliberalism has been fundamentally based on the idea that it's a nat the natural order of things. And it is a kind of an inevitable, non-negotiable things that we just have to, have to, have to adjust to. But actually, quite a, neoliberalism is increasingly being quite overtly political in the way that it is governed in the EU. So, for example, with Next Generation EU and the, and the European semester, the Commission bureaucracy comes very much in focus and not necessarily in a good light. And that potentially opens the scope for uh, uh, for, for, uh, for, for contestation. One interesting thing is that conditionalities are also at least theoretically put on surplus countries now to, uh, to actually access the, um, uh, the monies that have been generated from their own taxation authority. However, the politicization is more based, not really based on a kind of a fiscal federal public, but more in line with the way that multinational corporations uh, discipline uh, their subsidiaries and so-called whipsawing uh, uh, techniques. And that favors a basically not a common European conversation, but different conversations for each member state. So we get like 27 different conversations that are nationally focused. And that creates it's a fragmental national public that makes it very, very difficult to, uh, to have a kind of a pan-European uh, conversation. But it is also something that uh, potentially generalizes more nationalization and fragmentation that could potentially threaten the European project uh, 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 down the line. Okay, that's me. Thank you very much. I leave it to Heike and his central claims. All right, thank you, Magnus, and we will um, continue. Uh, we didn't know about each other's theses, so the, um, they come as surprise. And but uh, surprise, surprise, I will directly continue from where Magnus led this uh, discussion. I will first uh, try to share my screen as well. I have only one slide to show, and I try to keep this uh, very short. Okay. Um, so I have three theses on the future of the EU, and the um, the first concerns the the problem of uh, changing the European Union. Um, as Magnus pointed out, I agree with you, Magnus, that the um, um, there's a political problem. The way the current uh, structures of the EU are being reproduced by uh, or through a number of different mechanisms. But even if there was a political will to transform the European Union, there's a legal problem as well. And the, uh, this consists of um, two different aspects. I mean, on the one hand, um, there's this as part of the, um, the wider process of um, uh, using international law for neoconstitutional purposes, also the European Union has in a way defined many areas of political contestation as uh, issue, issues that are defined in the basic treaties of the EU. This means that they are actually um, taken away from the um, space of um, democratic politics. And, um, and this is especially uh, a difficult problem because 
the um, continuing reliance on the basic institutions of international law. And international law is based on the idea that there are separate sovereign states. And in order to amend a treaty or revise a treaty, you need actually the consent of all the member states. This actually makes the, the basic treaties of the European Union um, the, um, even stronger or even more resistant to change than national constitutions. And this is a real difficulty that we are seeing. So even if we had like something like 70% uh, of the governments fully supportive of uh, kind of a new start for the European Union and, and so on and so forth, but I mean, this 30% uh, would be quite sufficient for actually um, the um, uh, preventing that from happening. The, my second thesis concerns the current situation. Uh, the measures introduced during this crisis, COVID crisis, many of them are groundbreaking. Monetary policy has become ever more unconventional. Austerity has been lifted. Uh, a part of new debt is now being mutualized and the EU own resources will be increased as well. And there's still this possibility that uh, EU own resources will also include uh, European taxes as well. However, Many of these uh, measures are meant to be temporary only. And at the same time, uh, as Magnus already uh, pointed out, neoliberalization continues uh, through various uh, work processes, for instance, in terms, and especially in terms of structural reforms. And I anticipate that this attempt to model through in this way will mean that the, uh, uh, once we are back to the uh, old game of austerity, et cetera, uh, we will be seeing very troubled times ahead. The, um, uh, the, my third thesis is that the, um, um, assuming that this legal problem and the underlying political problem uh, can be overcome, and the, the current constraints and the contradictions of the EU um, would be overcome as well. That would take the European Union toward a federalist direction. And um, I have no objections to that. I actually think that the, uh, to have a monetary union without the fiscal union is, is, uh, is, is a contradictory thing and it can't uh, be sustained over long periods of time. But the, there's a further problem. Uh, and this is that the European Union in, is in fact is only a very small part of the world and is in all kinds of ways intertwined with global processes. Even legally, the EU has been constituted on the other elements and parts of the system of international law. And, but also um, in terms of the world economy, it's uh, very much uh, a small part of this um, whole. The, um, um, the European population is only about 5% of the world population. At the moment, the European GDP is on 15% of the world GDP, but it is declining very rapidly. And it will be less than 10% in no time at all. So the EU is quite dependent on the development of functional global uh, systems of governance in areas such as trade, finance, climate, and security. There is no single major problem um, of humanity that the EU can actually tackle on its own. That does be my three theses, and we can now start the... Uh, the discussion. One of the problems of, of having a having a very fierce discussion and uh, animated discussion is when the two presenters agree as much as as you and I do. Uh, um, but I actually thought that maybe one thing that um, that I would would sort of raise, uh, and also it's partly a sort of as a critical mark to myself. I've been on on uh, record many, many times in pointing out the limits and the fragility and the crisis of the, of the EU. But um, I just wonder, is, should we entertain the possibility that, um, at least in the short term, that this is actually quite a clever move by uh, these measures as a kind of a, a, a partial Keynesian methodology and uh, with quite a lot of green stuff sort of thrown in that that might actually just stabilize uh, EU as a neoliberal project in a, and it's a kind of a, a kind of a compromise you know that I've been playing around with the Gramscian idea of a passive revolution that uh, when, a, when a power block becomes too narrow it faces a whole set of structural challenges 
it, it, it adjusts flexibly and it co-opts and, and thereby it stabilizes itself. So, you know. Well, that, that's, that's true, but I mean, at the same time, it's, it's also indicative of the problem because it, it seems that the, the, the official, uh, the thinking behind the European Union, including the new, new classical macroeconomics of the 1970s, that the innovative uh, is the foundation of the EMU. I mean, those theories don't obviously work. But at the level of the basic EU treaties, I mean, they're still in force. I mean, nothing has changed at that level. And, and this is the problem. I mean, in a way, there's a kind of a widespread recognition that the uh, system as it was designed in the 1980s and early 1990s doesn't actually work. And at the same time, <laughs> you know, the, uh, there's no attempt to actually change the system. So the, these, these things that um, these measures that have been taken now, they are very good measures, and, and I agree that they can, in the, in the short run, they can actually stabilize the situation in Europe, and that's fine. But the, the problem is that they are meant to be only temporary. I didn't say it was fine. I was just wondering whether it could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the idea of passive revolution is, is nice, um, but I mean, uh, to what extent we can actually, is it, is it based on extrapolation of some trends that we are seeing at the moment? Because we also know the mechanism that the, we already have the, um, these measures in place, but according to the EU basic treaties, there has to be a return to the uh, business as usual as soon as possible. Because I mean, this is based on the idea that there's this acute crisis, COVID-19, and that um, gives um, the um, EU a possibility to actually do things otherwise, but only temporarily, not permanently. So is there any basis to think that this is kind of a sign of passive revolution? Well, I think it is. I mean, I, I, mean, I think that there are, there are two things there. I mean, first and foremost, I mean, I would say that you always need to see these things in relation to the German question. I think that uh, the, the, the German business and the German state is, is very, very central and decisive in all this. And nothing of this would have happened if not Germany had agreed with France uh, to go down the, the, this route. And I think to some extent, this is, this is a recognition that the framework is actually a fundamentally unstable and they are trying to stretch it as much as possible within the parameters. But I also think that it seems to me, and the, you, can, you can look, for example, at, at uh, recent reports from, from uh, Business uh, Europe uh, and the, the German uh, business associations, that there is a recognition that uh, in order to maintain the euro area, which is absolutely central for their accumulation strategies, you are going to have to have some form of transfer mechanism. You're going to have to have some kind of a mutualization. But in exchange for that, uh, uh, there has to be structural reforms. There has to be market making uh, criteria. There has to be discipline on, on labor and so on and so forth. And I'm actually quite struck by the extent to which uh, the reforms, as they are, con uh, uh, they are they are configured now are consistent with uh, uh, with that uh, uh, with those preferences. So there, on the one hand, on the other hand, I think it's very good that you bring up the legal uh, problems because you know absolutely those legal constraints exist. But also, what is more is is that trying to tweak these things within the the, the legal a configuration as it as it is it really kind of creates problems. So there are still questions about the extent to which what the European Central Bank is doing is is actually legal, and you you have and also this is in relation to to divisions within the German uh, power bloc, uh, the German elite. So there are those who are basically being marginalized, seeing themselves as being marginalized, challenging these things in the Europe in the in the German constitutional court, and are actually having having a lot of traction on that. So the, the latest thing is, of course, that next generation EU is being halted by the, the, the Germans are being, being, being halted from ratifying next generation EU from the constitutional court until they've, heard, they've had a hearing on it. And I think that this is actually quite, quite indicative of the, of the, of the constraints. Mm. Well, if you, if you look at the, um, uh, this contradictory set of um, policies that are being implemented at the moment. You mentioned the uh, market making and the um, uh, controlling labor or disciplining labor and so on and so forth. Um, this disciplining actually has, a, has another term. It means flexibilization of the labor market. I mean, that's, they, they, they try to combine 
security and flexibility. But in fact, I mean, it's more the flexibility part that dominates the developments. Now, the, is, this is not only contradictory from an economic point of view, meaning in terms of uh, creating the basis of, of sustainable economic growth in the European Union, but it's also a kind of a political contradiction as, as well in a sense that by um, the making life more uncertain and more market dependent, even we can use the, the ideas of Karl Polanyi to, to try to understand what this means, that I mean, the, the society becomes increasingly disembodied and increasingly dominated by self-regulating markets and people become increasingly dependent on those. It means that these people are uh, facing existential insecurity. And this is, the, this is fertile ground for the further rise of nationalist populism in um, an authoritarian populism as well in Europe. So politically speaking, I mean, the, uh, the European Union is undermining itself by this contradictory set of, of policies that they are now implementing. So the, the very enemies, well, if you look at things from a kind of a European Commission perspective, the enemies of the European Union are being strengthened by the very policies of the European Commission. So that raises the, the possibility of another, another future, which is fragmentation. Uh, and maybe the, the outright uh, collapse of, of uh, European Union, does it? I mean, the one interesting thing about this, and this is why I try to sort of indicate, is that actually this, this European semester form of governance based on how multinational corporations uh, discipline their subsidiaries by putting up, uh, uh, you know, the, the master, uh, the, the, good, uh, the good boys and girls versus those that need to be disciplined and creating this basically 27 different national conversations is that it actually encourages uh, that, kind of, that kind of fragmentation. And, and it also uh, uh, encourages this idea that is very, very ingrained in, in places like Finland and Sweden, probably more even than, than in Germany, that, that uh, you know, this, this idea of competitive corporatism. We, try to be competitive, we are prudent in our, in our fiscal policies, generate surpluses and so on and so forth that others have to absorb. And on the basis of that, we retain some kind of more retrenched, but broadly, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, social safety measures, but it's sort of very, very much couched in in nationalist uh, terms. And yeah, sort of but neoliberalism yeah, itself can be also nationalist. And for instance, yeah. the idea of uh, uh, competitiveness that is actually played out in, in the European Union at two levels. I mean, on the one hand, the member states have to be competitive in the world markets. I mean, that's the, one of the ideas, but the world market for them actually consists of other member states. I mean, the, most of the European uh, EU member countries are actually exporting and importing from other uh, member countries more than from the outside world. And the, but the second level is the European Union itself. So you have like uh, economic nationalism at two different levels. It's not economic nationalism in the sense of protectivism. It's, it's economic nationalism in, in the sense of our particular entity, our community being more competitive than the others. Um, and the, so the European Union vis-a-vis vis -vis the rest of the world try to be as competitive as possible. And, and in, a, in a way, the, the ideal seems to be some kind of um, um, attempt to uh, develop the, uh, the, the German situation on the scale, on a global scale as well. So that you are having a lot of surplus and you can use that for your own economic development, etc. But that's of course contradictory because we know that the... Um, global trading system, and this applies also to the intra-EU trade as well, is, um, uh, is the, the imports and exports cancel out, that the total sum of all exports and imports is always zero. This means that, I mean, if you have systematic surplus somewhere in the system, you have systematic deficit in some other part of the system as well. The euro crisis was in part generated by that dynamics, and the uh, and the the same can happen and has happened and will happen also on a global scale as well. So it's very short sighted, but at the same time it, it also feeds into nationalism as well. It's so this there's kind of a Latin nationalism about this. Adam Harms had a very nice article in 2012 in uh, Review of International Political Economy about neoliberal uh, nationalism. And the, um, there he argued 
and I think this is a good point to make that the um, that the uh, the use a particular term transnational capital favors nationalism when it seems uh, when uh, there's an anticipation that the um, uh, supranationalism uh, could become too leftist. I'm amazed, so people, I, I, I'm amazed that people consider that to be such a tremendous insight. For me, it, it is it is actually quite quite clear from the beginning that uh, that neoliberalism is nationalist. And if you actually go back and look at at this uh, the, this idea of an interstate federalism that Hayek uh, promoted as early as in the late 1930s, it is exactly based on 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 that idea that uh, uh, you know he he thought that uh, that because uh, peoples are nationally constituted, they are not going to agree with other peoples, the kind of redistributive and market uh, countering regulations that they would do on a national level with others, because they would not have that kind of solidarity with, with others to do that. So he thought that this was actually the perfect way of containing uh, and minimalizing the state at the European level. So, you know, uh, the kind of things that you're talking about, the legal obstacles and the thresholds for coming to, to making, uh, uh, coming up to common solution with Fritz Sharp, of course, the joint decision trap was sort of very much sort of envisaged uh, okay. already there. Um, I, I, but I, I'd like to sort of invite you a little bit to, uh, uh, to have a conversation about what you very much sort of pushed always, which is that you can't, you, you have to look at the sort of the European uh, questions at the global level, and it makes no sense to sort of to, to sort of just have a kind of a European methodology, methodological Europeanism, I guess you, you you would call it. So, you know, in terms of other fragmentary tendencies, um, I mean, one thing that has been created in the neoliberal period, and maybe that is also a sort of a Polanyian double movement, is the is the uh, is the inevitable rise of communist China. Or state capitalist China, rather, uh, as a serious uh, hegemonic contender. And uh, uh, one thing about the European Green Deal that is very, very clear when you read it, if you look at it in relation to the kind of the kind of discussions that have been made and the uh, the, the analysis of critical uh, 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 raw materials. Uh, uh, where there is a sort of a tremendous, I mean, lithium is, is, is one obvious one, where we, we go towards electrical cars and where we're going to need to extract in Latin America and all those kind of things. And it brings us all back to the dependency theoretical stuff, but, but also, you know, in Africa and the sort of talk about China as a geopolitical rival exactly on those, on those kind of uh, terms. Uh, uh, there is also the whole, the whole question about whether we 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 use basically the the carbon adjustment uh, 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 as a tariff, uh, uh, and that was of course prompted by by the United States uh, uh, you, you, you sort of uh, going away from the Paris Agreement. They're back now again. I just wonder: are these also sort of indications of uh, of the fragmentation scenario, or what? How do you see that? I mean, one thing that the Bruegel uh, Institute have, have suggested is a kind of a way of trying to square this by coming up with some kind of a transatlanticist climate club where there is a kind of an alliance that is made by uh, you, the United States under under Biden, but it's also open to others, including China, if they actually then abide by by those kind of things. Are they? Is this a, is this about fragmentation, or is it about is this about uh, neoliberalism managing its contradictions and sort of just chugging along, and and uh, and in the end, the transatlantic alliance will 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 hold. And what does well, this tell us about the global south? And so forth. Well, um, if we think about raw materials and dependence on, on raw materials, and particular parts of economic growth imply dependence on certain um, raw materials, or well, think about climate change, um, a kind of a common issue uh, uniting all of humanity, all, the, all of the planet, um, in one way. I mean, both can either feed cooperation or conflict, and the um, uh, it's it's not uh, the 
the issue as such that determines what the responses are, but rather the modes of responsiveness that are prevalent in different places. And if you have this kind of economic nationalism in place already, and then we have the, the security game as well. And we know that the relationships between different great powers in the world have been, have, have been deteriorating for a long while. We are already, we, the, the world surpassed the, uh, the Cold War levels of armaments, for instance, already many years ago. And the, uh, so within this kind of a context, it is uh, possible and likely that the, um, these uh, dependencies um, will be uh, securitized, defined in terms that in fact territorialize them. And this generates a kind of a near imperial tendency and the kind of a replay of the developments that occurred before the First World War, where the, um, uh, the internal contradictions of these uh, new uh, industrial, industrialized powers uh, the led to their expansion to the other parts of the world. Now we can't have the same kind of a territorial expansion. I mean, that's impossible in, in the contemporary world. So it's, it's kind of a postmodern version of the same. But nonetheless, I mean, the, the, this, it means that these uh, different uh, states, uh, continental states like China, the United States, the European Union, uh, etc., Russia, the, uh, some of the other big countries like Brazil, I mean, they create alliances and they, uh, the, there's a kind of a dynamic going on that can lead to uh, kind of a catastrophe as well. So it's not only fragmentation. I mean, I think it's antagonism on a global scale that is the real problem. And the, um, it's also possible that the European Union will start to uh, assume this kind of a role in, the, in this global power game. I mean, one possible way of creating unity within the European Union is by way of defining external enemies, mm. or perhaps they can be partly internal as well. And, the, um, and, and this is, of course, something that we've been seeing during the past few years, that as a response to the euro crisis and the aftermath, I mean, unless you want to, and unless you can actually transform the European Union um, in political economy terms and also democratically. The, uh, the alternative response is to, to militarize the European Union. And the, um, and the, the, um, the justifications in a way um, are there already. I mean, the or potential justifications for this, and not only potential, I mean, to the extent they are also actual already, that the um, um, conflict with Russia, I mean, the uh, China's in a threat. Some of the issues uh, are now being uh, the uh, uh, securitized. I mean, th think about the dependence on certain developments in the uh, internet. I mean, the, uh, the new 5G networks and those kinds of things. I mean, the, the, there's um, an increasing tendency to see things as something that is potentially threatening to us, whoever this us is. And I see this as a kind of a major problem. There would be a, a way uh, forward and, and a way to overcome this. It means systems of global cooperation. I mean, that the uh, more attention should be paid to uh, building new global common institutions. I think the, uh, please, uh, the, the term may not be, the best possible, but I actually think that there's something into it. It's not literal, to, to be taken literally, but I think there's certain inevitability uh, to the, um, these kinds of developments uh, in the course of this century. The question is only whether we need a kind of a major crisis before it happens or not. And therefore, I think it's very important that when we are discussing the future of the European Union, it's always in a global context. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I, I mean, I, I think, but here we have a little bit of a paradox, I think, in terms of global governance. And I think that, that if, if uh, uh, the European Union is, uh, is, is suffering from the limitations of international law, and, uh, and of course, you, then uh, what about any kind of global governance outside the European Union in terms of uh, density and capacity and so on and so forth, because at least within the European Union, 
uh, you know, within the framework of the treaties, we have direct effect, we have supremacy of EU law and so on and so forth, that generates at least the potential for some kind of collective, collectively binding, uh, uh, for, 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 for sort of legalizing collectively binding decisions on the basis of solidarity is not being used for that. And it is it is very difficult to get, as you said, the sort of the the, uh, the sort of the, the common agreed threshold to, to do those kind of things. But if that exists at the European Union level, what about the global level? I mean, it, it, yeah. that is even more of a problem. It is, um, but it, it's only a, um, a major problem to the extent we are talking about the, the existing systems of global governance. But when we are talking about the possibility of establishing new ones, it's not a, a problem in the same way. I mean, you can create a new international treaty and thereby a new system of um, governance. Um, and then you're free to actually decide what the underlying rules and principles are. So you can actually write into that fundamental constitutional treaty the principles according to which you can actually also change the re regime in a democratic fashion. So you don't need to have the classical international law built into every uh, future treaty, but you can actually gradually, uh, system by system, um, in, in terms of different functional areas of governance, you can actually start to build uh, the um, more cosmopolitan system of, of law. And this is the kind of a Kantian dream um, of the late 18th century already that the uh, that you can uh, possibly build something that is more universalistic than the international law currently is. Or some of the critical legal scholars like Marty Koskenemi here in Helsinki um, also arguing that it's, it's contradictory as well, that there's this world community and state, sovereign states that are supposedly totally independent of this world community, but at the same time, whatever they argue in international law always has to make a reference to this world community. Well, the problem with Kant, as Hegel pointed out, is that uh, there is a radical separation between the rational and the real, and the problem is how do we reconcile these, these things? And, uh, you know, so what is it about this? Is this a kind of a, a kind of a Rawlsian uh, veil of ignorance? Is a kind of a Habermasian uh, speech community? But how do you kind of actually relate this to, to the, the real configuration so that we are, I mean, you're going to have to create this out of the world as it is, and uh, and how does that look? But but listen, I mean, I think that this raises into. I mean, we, you and I have here done certain projections. We could even have been said to have made certain predictions, uh, or at least sort of laid out things in terms of balances of probability. Uh, this, uh, you know, the, the overarching theme about about this area is altogether is about thinking about how do we actually think about the future? How do we think about things like utopias and so on and so forth? And what does the sort of the conversation that we've had say about the way that we are approaching this? And, and uh, what, are they, what are the merits and limitations in the way that you and I have been discussing it now? And I am asking this because I know at the, at the sort of a more meta level that you are very, very interested in scenario painting and uh, and uh, the relationship between the, the intransitive and the transitive and so on and so forth. So, so what, what's your kind of, what's your take on, on, on how one should approach uh, uh, possible futures and, and scenarios? Well, I mean, the, the reason why we build scenarios rather than trying, trying to predict the future is precisely that there are many possible futures, not only one, and that we, we can uh, then build scenarios about the processes that might lead to a particular kind of an outcome. They have to be relatively vague because you can't uh, anticipate particular events, or usually you can't. Um, whereas uh, the, um, but you, you can still um, anticipate uh, the processes and how they are occurring to the extent that we have knowledge that is of course based on history and things are changing. So we can't simply rely on that knowledge, but the, um, uh, what the, the, the relevant mechanisms are, how these structures actually, uh, what kinds of causal effects they tend to have, what is the overall field and the, uh, what, how that determines the characteristic situations that actors face, what are the modes of responsiveness that are prevalent in a particular context. On that basis, we can, write these scenarios. But I have another concept that is, in a way, trying to overcome this uh, uh, Hege Hegelian uh, dichotomy between reason and the, uh, and the world. No, no, Hegel tried uh, to overcome the dichotomy. The dichotomy is on Kant. Yeah, well, in a way, that's true. Uh, but of course, I mean, the um, Hegel solution was very idealistic, if you like. It was, yes. 
but the rational tendential directionality of all history, which combines. Oh, the Hegel idea would of, like that. Yeah, well, I, perhaps, or perhaps a Hegelian Marxist or Marxian Hegelian or whatever. But the the uh, the idea that there are real tendencies in world history, and then there's the rational direction that can only be. Uh, the established in a given so context. I mean, it can change and it will be not the end of history. History will remain um, open. And the um, uh, and of course, it's also a matter of democratic debate about what, whether this is the rational direction to take and so on and so forth. But my argument is, and this is what on what my earlier point about inevitability uh, actually is all about, is that the in the current uh, conjunction, in world history, the rational tendential directionality is the word global Keynesianism in a green and understood in a green and democratic way. And the uh, and that's the where all these arguments are, are you know uh, leading to the um, that we need to build these global institutions that may make, make it possible for us to actually have at least some control over the direction of world history that we are not simply. Uh, like in this Tolstoy's novel War and Peace, uh, some the some sort of elements that only have to take um, as given whatever might happen. I mean, the war breaks out and you are there as so kind of a pawn in the game and can do nothing. Uh, whereas, I mean, the the classical uh, kind of a Keynesian post Keynesian idea was to to actually achieve some uh, rational control over the direction of history, but of course in a democratic way, which means that there are different opinions about what the most rational direction is and so on and so forth. It's not, and the idea is not to create a kind of a, a world monarchy that can't fear, it, but rather something like a system of um, global democracy and which can be organized along functionalist lines more than territorial lines. I um, struggle to see the mechanisms given the conversation that we've had about the state of the world, the sort of the, the bridges, uh, these two things. But if I'm going to sort of look at a bit of a silver lining about what, um, what you know, and going back to the, uh, to the initiatives at the European level, it is all, by necessity. Uh, and I think that that is a sort of a, sort of a very, very sort of slight uh, yeah, a validation of what you're saying in terms of global tendencies and so on and so forth is that, you know, it's, it's almost like European elites are forced and actually bringing they very, very slowly the, the, the publics with them to actually see uh, the European uh, uh, economy as an integral object rather than as a collection of, of national economies, as an, as an object that requires some form of management and regulation. And uh, that is creating all kinds of dissonances and, and, and difficulties and so on and so forth. But you, there is certainly a compulsion that requires that. And if you also then think about what is actually required in terms of sustainable development, and you take into account things like even with the European Green Deal, what it requires in terms of raw materials, you can also start to have a conversations of making uh, the world a an object of, uh, of, of analysis that requires some form of, of, of collective action, if nothing else, a management. Now that is a very, 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 very thin silver lining because it, you know, to actually bring this about in terms of the vision that you have requires a tremendous amount of collective action, which I see very little of. And then I also think that the sort of the European governance isn't, isn't exactly encouraging. That's the last thing that I have to say on this. And I, I would be quite happy at this point to, uh, to see whether the audience have any, any, any questions and, and, and comments to take. Yeah, just one, one more point. I mean, the, you can see this also as a kind of a collective learning process. And when the, um, um, uh, think about, for instance, the um, the emergence of the concept of the world economy, and that occurred at the time when capitalist market society was built in the 18th century and early 19th century, and for the first time it was really clearly present in David Ricardo's um, 18 um, 19 book, where he defended free free trade and and talked about comparative advantage and, and so on and so forth. But there was also the idea that this creates kind of a common public good for the world as a whole. And the, uh, this was the first time that somebody really articulated the idea of a world economy. 
of course, I mean, he was a uh, economic liberal, so he thought that the uh, self-regulating markets will be the job. But once you uh, started to develop the idea that this is not the case, but there emerged uh, kind of a, almost like an immediate response to the development of this kind of a capitalist world economy, the more socialist, social democratic uh, response that was also based on an idea of what the inherent tendencies to uh, inequalities, crises, and those kinds of things. You started to see that the this whatever uh, separable, separated economy actually requires uh, systematic the uh, regulation. Um, control it has to be embedded in society one way or the other it has to be has to, there has to be some democratic and societal control over it and the um, uh, and this gave rise of course already in the late 19th century and early 20th century before the first world war already uh, this gave rise to the idea that the the, the the whole has to be governed there has to be also some institutions to govern the whole it's not enough to have states but we have a world economy, a world system, a planetary economy. And of course, obviously, I mean, the, by that time, there were many functionalist organizations as well. People started, have, start, started to realize that you needed to coordinate time and space and organize many things like how do you communicate with others in other countries and across the world and, and so on and so forth. So you, had to, you needed common rules and regulations and systems of governance and so on and so forth. This has been a learning process. I mean, the Bretton Woods system took this to another, to another level. Now we've been living through this neoliberal era. There has been this belief in the self-regulating markets. But once this belief is shattered, and many argue that it's already, it already has been shattered, the, uh, uh, I'm sure we will get to the next level of developing these common institutions. I have to say, I'm struck by your functionalism, and it, it sort of comes very much through. And for me, I am much more skeptical and pessimistic on this, because if, if having studied the European Union, which of course was based on an almost has a neo-functionalism as its ideology, I am extremely pessimistic about the possibility that the communication channels as such generate the requisite collective action. I said, I mean, it will not be easy. Rational tendency and directionality doesn't mean that it is necessary to happen in a particular way, in a particular time, or anything of that sort. And the uh, world history remains open and contingent. But I think there are, it's a tendential direction as well. It's not only rational. And there are real tendencies toward that direction. And one of those tendencies that, or one of those forces that are creating, generating this tendency is our collective learning. And that's what the University and Science and Helsinki College for Advanced Studies are all about, right? Well, I can't, I can't disagree with that. So let's open up. <laughs>